If you want to start identifying minerals and living with minerals, then you got to know the terminology. You got to be able to speak about what these things are and be able to communicate with others about the properties that you're dealing with. Now, all of these terms I've listed here are related to identifying minerals. They're all properties of minerals, but each of them, the lay person might not know exactly what they refer to, right? So I want to go through here and provide specifically definitions of what each of these terms means as it is applied to mineral identification. So hardness. The lay person might think of hardness as how, how, how do I define this without saying hard? How not soft something is, right? But in the context of mineral identification, it refers specifically to its resistance to scratching. So if you scratch a mineral against another one and the first one gets scratched itself, then it's softer. It has less hardness than the other one. That's a little bit cryptic. That didn't sound too well. So what if we say we have a way of ordering hardness, right? And that's the most hardness scale. A lot of you have probably heard of this. It's a completely ordinal scale, meaning it's just ordering them. It doesn't go by any linear or logarithmic pattern that ranks different minerals based on their hardnesses. And then you fit them into that based on what they scratch and what they don't scratch. So talc, for example, is one, gypsum is two, and it goes up, 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 and up until it reaches diamond at 10. It's nearly impossible to scratch a diamond. So that's hardness. Luster. This one, I think a lot of people's intuition would be correct. It's the sort of way that light reflects, the way that light interacts with the surface of the mineral. So there are a whole bunch of different lusters. Metallic would be a common one to refer to things like metal elements. Uh, magnetite is an iron ore and it indeed looks very metallic at the surface. It has a metallic luster. The, ver the most common luster we see is vitreous, which means similar to glass. So that would be things like quartz, a lot of gemstone minerals like uh, beryl, topaz, things like that. So luster is all about light and how light interacts on the surface of the mineral. Pretty simple. Defining what you mean by certain lusters can get a little bit hairy. You know, oh, is it vitreous or is it subvitreous? Just getting familiar with them will allow you to sort of see the differences and nobody's going to throw a fit if you call something vitreous, subvitreous. But you should know there's a little bit of nuance in there. Streak. Streak, we have streak plates to test this on minerals and streak is the color but not just the color. The color of a mineral is pretty trivial because so many of them can have different impurities and inclusions where any given mineral can be a huge number of different colors, right? The classic example of that is quartz. You've got amethyst, citrine, smoky quartz, milky quartz, you know, and it's all the, chemically the same thing, quartz. Um, but color, when it is scratched or rubbed on a plate. And the streak plates we use are porcelain, usually, which means they've got a hardness of about 6.5 or 7, which means that not all minerals can be scratched on them. But usually if a mineral is that hard, then it has a white streak, so we're not too interested anyways. So streak is the color when it is scratched, and this is constant for any given mineral. You know, something like hematite, which can be either blood red or black. Hematite is, of course, an iron ore. It'll always have that kind of rusty red streak. So it's much more diagnostic than something like color that you see on the surface. Density and specific gravity, these should be familiar. You know, these are frequent, you know, engineering or scientific or mathematical parameters that you'd be using in equations. Density refers to, of course, mass of something over the volume, m over v. That's density. We usually call that rho, right? The Greek letter rho. Specific gravity is a little bit different, and some people get a little bit confused with this. Specific gravity is 
it's a way of saying it's the density of the mineral. So we'll call that rho m, density of the mineral, whatever you're measuring, divided by the density of water. So this is interesting because for, you know, if you're using the metric system, and this is one case where I really like the metric system over the, <laughs> over uh, the imperial, but you know, the, the density of water is about, what is it, a thousand, a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. So it works out really nicely. If you say that a mineral, let's say, for example, uh, barite has a specific gravity of around four, then you can think, oh, four over, so four is equal to the density of the mineral divided by the specific grav, the, excuse me, I'm mixing them up, the density of water. If the density is a thousand, then it makes it super easy with your calculations, right? You'd say, oh, the density then is 4,000 kilograms per cubic meter, and then based on the mass of it or the volume of it, you could determine how much that weighs. Um, so that's specific gravity. A little bit different from density, although the, the metric is pretty much the same. The way we use them is nearly identical. Fracture. Now, fracture and cleavage, it's important to note the differences between these. Fracture is just how how a mineral breaks in a very general sense, right? How it breaks. And you'd say, well, what, what, what does that mean, right? And we describe fracture with terms like conchoidal, subconchoidal, uneven. And it's when, you know, you, you break a mineral. Think of smashing a crystal with a hammer or something like that. What's going to happen to it, right? What's that break going to look like? Because it, it is predictable and we can in a lot of minerals, see patterns in the way they do. Like the famous example is quartz, which has a very conchoidal fracture. Now, a lot of minerals, if their fracture is what we call uneven, then it's a lot more difficult to discern. But it's a description of the surface where the break occurs. Tenacity is the, the mechanical behavior of the material. Or the mineral. So a lot of these terms, if you like material science, should sound familiar. Describing a, a mineral with a brittle tenacity, right? You would say, oh, it's brittle. Well, what does that mean? Well, once you put enough load on it, it'll just fracture, right? As opposed to something like steel, which you would say, oh, well, it becomes ductile and it starts to deform plastically, something like that. Uh, there are a few other terms that you might not have heard, like sectile or sectile, which applies to certain minerals that can be cut with a knife. Um, so things like your clay minerals or some phyllosilicates like talc that are very soft, you might describe as sectile. Of course, they're elastic. Uh, all of them behave elastically before they fracture brittling. So just terms like these, a, a lot of minerals will just say the tenacity is brittle because of course, materials wise, they are all ceramics. So this one is usually pretty moot to describe because almost all minerals do behave in this manner. It will mostly be, like I said, things like clay, probably not. Those will be failing on little shear planes, um, which will make it different, but tenacity for the most part, brittle. Now cleavage, not to be confused with uh, the cleavage that you get during mitosis, cleavage is similar to fracture, but instead of just a general sense of how a mineral breaks, it describes the specific crystallographic planes along which a mineral will break. That's about as in-depth as I need to get for the sake of this video, but just think of it as planes. And the question you might ask, and quickly identify is how many, right? With, with fracture, it's more about shape. With cleavage, you're going to be asking and answering how many cleavage planes. So for a quick example, something like halite. Think of halite. Usually it's in these nice cubes, right? And that's because halite has three planes of cleavage. You can think of that as a plane. The face up there is a plane and the face right there is a plane. So it gets these three nice, really flat faces. 
That's sort of the easiest way to think about cleavage, and it applies specifically to when the mineral is broken, not necessarily just how it forms, which is crystal habit, which we'll get into in a second. Diaphaneity, I don't know why I throw the, threw this on here. It's a fancy word for opacity or transparency. Uh, if a mineral exhibits a lot of diaphaneity, it is transparent. So of course, no minerals are really transparent, but a lot of them are translucent. You know, you think of something like crystal quartz, milky quartz, you can see through them a little bit. A lot of gemstone forming minerals, those kind of things, they're translucent. And then things like ores, magnetite, hematite, gertite, pyrite, those are all going to be opaque, and you're not going to be able to see through them. And finally, crystal habit. A lot of times people might think that because something has cubic cleavage, it also has cubic crystal habit. Crystal habit describes the way the crystals form. So I'm going to do a whole video on these because there are a whole bunch of different ones. You know, a secular, a betroidal, cubic, tabular, whole bunch of different ways to describe crystals. And they're all just based on the shapes the crystals form in. And this is also not to be confused with crystal structure, which is a crystallographic property that is at the actual microscopic scale. Crystal habit is macro. It's going to be describing the stuff that you actually see with the naked eye. So that's just a list of basic terms that you should be familiar with and what they mean as applied to mineral identification.